to today's episode of the Osafsu Show. With me today is the Special Advisor to the President on Media and Publicity, Mr. Femi Adeshino. Thank you so much for joining thank us you. there. Thank you. Pleasure well. always to be here. <laughs> thank you so much. So if you've been following the program for the last couple of months, especially since the um, uh, resumption of the new administration, you've seen that we've done a couple of trending issues with Femi Adeshino. So this is where we discuss and answer your questions uh, sent to us from social media, that's Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And uh, we give the special advisors to the president uh, the opportunity to answer them and give you the stance of the government on these issues. So for the first half of the show, I will be uh, asking Mr. Femi Adeshino questions that I have prepared myself. Then for the second half of the show, we'll field questions directly from social media that you will be sending using the hashtag Ask Femi Adeshino and the Osasu Show. So without further ado, sir, thank you again. I hope, I hope it's a friendly fire. <laughs> it's a friendly, it's always, it's always a friendly, friendly match every time that you're here, okay. you know. So we okay. always love having you on the show. Lots of laughs. Thank but you. But we are actually going to start off with a very serious topic. <clears throat> when I was in um, New York for the United Nations General Assembly, the recently concluded United Nations General Assembly, um, I had the opportunity to ask the president about the humanitarian crisis going on in the northeastern part of the country. Um, a, a report just was just published by Matthew Page, former U.S. State Department's top expert on Nigeria. He said uh, perhaps the most alarming, perhaps the most alarming aspect of the research was that. Uh, he said, one could argue, however, that the invisible IDPs we met are luckier than those living in government-run camps, which are described by experts as dreadful places where malnourishment and sexual abuse are rife. Mm. In these supposedly safe locations, women and girls are forced into prostitution mm. by errant soldiers, vigilantes, and relief workers. When they want to go out to access food or get help, they are forced to give sex to the soldiers and vigilantes before they are allowed to leave the camp. This is what an aid worker was lamenting. So is the government aware of this, number one? And number two, how do we address such, a, such an alarming you know, revelation? Well, alarming is the word. I'll add another one, dreadful mm -hmm. and uh, dispiriting. Uh, that's, that's a report that is not good at all. But uh, is the government aware? Yes, the government is aware. Because I remember that uh, the Minister for uh, Women Resources, uh, Aja Aisha Al-Hazan, brought it up before in a, in a Federal Executive Council meeting. So it's something that government is aware of and is being addressed. I'm sure if you talk to that minister, she will tell you in practical terms what has been done about that development. Okay. And... Um Still on the issue of humanitarian crisis, 21 Tubok girls were recently released, which obviously we uh, commend the government for, but we still have a lot of girls who are still held in captive. Can you give us a time frame or a timeline when we can expect the release of the remaining girls? Well, I'll say 21 and counting, mm -hmm. and that's what I'll be able to say. As we speak now, before we rise from this place, news may come that we have another 80, we have another 100, we have another 150. Mm -hmm. That's the way it will continue till we reclaim all the Chibo girls that are available to be reclaimed. That's another question. Has, yes. has the government been able to assess how many girls are actually alive versus how many we've lost to, due to airstrikes and you know, the conditions they've no, been No, it's, it's going to be difficult to be definite about those who are alive is the captors who can say that this is the number and that And how many have. have they said so far? Uh, no, you know I'm not involved in negotiation. <laughs> it's a security thing. Okay. And uh, you know naturally security things are covered. You do it covertly. So it's only Boko Haram. And I tell you because Boko Haram itself is factionalized. I doubt if one faction can say definitively that this is the total number of girls available because uh, yeah. He can only talk on the number it has. He doesn't know how many will be with another faction. Mm -hmm. But the determination is that as many as are alive, the government is determined to get back. Okay, and back to the humanitarian crisis uh, that's occurring in government-run camps. You said Aisha al Hassan, the Minister of Women Affairs, will be able to give me more details. Yes. But this issue looks like 
it should be addressed with more seriousness. I know we don't know the extent of what the government is doing presently, yes. but this report just came out yesterday, meaning that this, um, this, this crisis is still going on till yeah. today. Yeah. So is it that the Minister of Women Affairs isn't doing enough? The government isn't paying enough attention? You know, why isn't it treated with much urgency? Is it because it hasn't been published in the public domain? No, no, you, you, you really need to know all that is happening behind the scenes, and I tell you, a lot is happening. You know, you first had a presidential initiative on Northeast, and then you have another presidential initiative that is going to be launched any moment from now on that IDP situation. And I tell you, there is no foreign delegation that meets our president that the president does not bring this issue up with. Mm. IDPs and what can be done to alleviate their situation. It's always topmost in the mind of the president. Uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross came two, three days ago. It was also one of the things the president said. Any foreign leader he meets, he raises the issues of IDPs. But well, that's why I know UNICEF is also struggling to, uh, to, to match the funds that they had projected they'll be able to raise for the issue that's going on in the Northeast because a lot of the international communities don't necessarily um, are, they're not necessarily 100% comfortable with the situation going on in, on ground. These government-run camps, this sexual abuse, rape, is being perpetrated by the people who are meant to protect these IDPs, government, you know, military people. So why would foreign, inv foreign um, aid come into the country and actually try to help them when they know that? No, I, I didn't talk of that specifically. I'm, okay. talking, of foreign, I'm talking of nutrition, medical assistance, okay. and all so that. So they are yeah. doing stuff in malnutrition, but not necessarily to oh, address this That issue. one will be the duty of the Nigerian government to address. Okay. And foreign, uh, foreign agencies exactly. or governments or institutions definitely will exactly. not come and to address Exactly, and when they are aware of issues like this, yes. they would probably be hesitant yes. to even, yes. you know. I, I, I will tell you that that problem, if it does exist, and I suspect it exists, it's a human problem. It's a human problem, it's a human feeling, and uh, human beings will have to address it, and that is government. But you did say the government is aware of this problem. Oh, oh, oh yes, of the problem generally in the IDP camps. Are and they like aware told, of the rape that you, is going on you, in the No, IDP this camp. report you said came out yesterday. Yes, sir. Therefore, what the Minister of Women Affairs spoke about must, would not have been this report. Okay, uh, yes, so this is the first time probably the government is hearing about the... No, no, I, I think something similar had come before. Had come before. Yes, because... But nothing is being... No, no, for it to have been raised at the Federal Executive Council meeting, that shows you that a lot is being done about it. Okay, so yeah. this was raised at... So I just want to get the facts right. Yes. This was rape. The rape allegations were, were raised at yes. the Federal Executive Council. Yes, So yes. something is being done. Definitely. But we don't really sure. know exactly no, to what extent. No, no. You know that will not be done <laughs> uh, on the pages of newspaper or okay. on television stations. Okay. Well, it will be done quietly. I believe the, it's been tackled. Okay, we're still talking about trending issues with Femi Adeshino. Moving on to the next subject. Uh, I stand with Aisha Buhari. <laughs> That's a trending issue that has taken social media by storm in the past few days where the wife of the president uh, said that a cabal, she alleged that a cabal has taken over the government, has taken over the administration of her husband. The president responded that his wife belongs, he doesn't know what party his wife belongs to, that she belongs to his kitchen, his living room and the other room. Uh, Garber Sheu, your colleague, the spokesman of the president, said that the president was joking. However, he rebuffed that by giving another interview and said that uh, his wife's duty is to take care of him. First of all, before we even get to the other issues that I've discussed, is there a cabal running this government? We, we had addressed that before. When it came up, we issued a statement asking those who alleged that there was a cabal to name members of the cabal. So if you don't name members of the cabal, then uh, they don't exist as far as we're concerned. So the president's wife? I didn't, I, you know I referred to the earlier allegation. Yes, sir. I'm not addressing the president's wife's comments. Exactly. Because so. I believe that that has been well taken care of. So it's not something I'll talk about. 
Okay, Sam. Okay. So we won't talk mm. about, okay. But I know, I don't want to talk about the kitchen, the other room, and the <laughs> living room. I think we've left that aside, and the well, president has been very clear on his stance. They, uh, they exist in every home. In every home you have the kitchen, <laughs> you have the living room, you have Which the one does your wife belong to, sir? All, every. All of every, them? All of them. Okay, all and she's them. also allowed to work, oh, and my, you see she, her. My wife is a professional, she, she works. Oh, okay, she works. sir. So she you don't works. believe she belongs to just one room, and you believe that you belong to every room as well as she is? Well, let's leave that matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but well I really want to address the, issue, address the issue of the cabal because the mm. Senate president has made the allegations. Dino Milai has made the allegations. Now the person who is closest to the president is making the same allegations. So I don't think this is something to just sweep under the rug. A lot of people have named, you know, a couple of people who are in charge of the government. Noel doesn't name the names then to put justification. Justification. Yes. So you don't agree with them? Unless they come with justification. So for me, the issue has been adequately Adequ handled. Okay, no problem at all. Sir, okay, before we take on some points from the um, social media, we would also like to discuss some other trending issues. When you were here on the show, uh, lastly, we talked about Zagato, the Fulani headsman clash. You said the president does not have to visit Agato to solve the issue going on. Do you stand by that comment? I stand by it. And did you read former President Olusha Mubasojo just yesterday? He I heard. He, yes. He said the Hazman famous clashes are not issues for the president to tackle. They are, issue for the, they are issues for the states and local governments to handle. And that is the truth. People have begun... I, I, I think maybe they're almost becoming paranoid about that matter simply because a full animal is president, then every attack by a herdsman must be sourced to the full anise. No, I think it's beyond that. The former president Obasanjo addressed it, and I think he addressed it very well. Between the states and the local governments, they must tackle that issue. And I believe it's been tackled because. Uh, as we speak, you know that uh, about 12 northern governors of northern states are in out Washington. in the... Yes. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that they're discussing. But so, you have a state like Benue who tells yeah. the federal government that Benue state is under siege by Fulani herdsmen. So is this still a problem of the state and the local government or is this a, an opportunity for it the federal still, government to intervene? It is still a... It's a serious situation, no doubt. The federal government must be interested in it and is interested in it, but you don't then source and locate that problem at the doorstep of the federal government. No, it is still states in a true federation. So is Boko states, Haram a state issue as well? No, Boko Haram can't be a state issue. Okay. Boko Haram is an insurgency against the federation. So, so don't you think this Fulani headsman attack also has the opportunity if let if if we if we let the situation you know if we don't tackle it heads on has I, the opportunity to escalate I, I, into I, I like think this. they are two incommensurates. They are not at the same level. They are not at the same level. Fulani headsmen. Wait, book, book, Fulani headsmen. That thing erupts when there are confrontations in farms. Is different from the wanton killing by Not Boko Haram. Not necessarily, sir. Uh -huh. I've been to Agatu myself, yes. and the situation that occurred, 300 people were killed on their farms. No confrontation beforehand. These herdsmen went into the farms and killed people without any previous you know, confrontation going on. So this Fulani herdsmen issue has has is probably going to escalate into an insurgency if not nipped in the bud beforehand. <laughs> no, no, no. I, criminality is criminality, and every criminality must be dealt with. Mm -hmm. That Fulani has been issue is being dealt with. Recall the October one broadcast of the president. He mentioned it. Yeah in that broadcast. Mm -hmm. That shows you that it's a serious matter. But it's it, still going on to today. Well, it's been solved. It's work in progress. But what do you say to a state like Benue who has come out to cry that their state is under siege by Fulani headsmen? The impression you give as we speak is that in Benue today, 
Nothing else is happening. But that's what the governor has said. Oh, no. The impression you give now. It's not really giving the impression. It's the governor has come out to say, my state, help me. Oh, He's yes. My state is under siege. He has a what is the right. Federal, the federal government should step in and intervene. He has every right to cry out. And when the president in a national broadcast mm -hmm. has told you that this issue has been tackled, Living. But how is it being tackled? Sir? Oh, really? <laughs> the, you, you, you seem to belong to the cynical group of Nigerians. <laughs> you want to add me to the wedding railers? <laughs> you know, some people are so cynical. They don't believe anything is being tackled. When the president comes out and says, we are handling this, is enough reason. But the president us. has said quite a number of things that we haven't So believed. you've got to believe him. He, that's well, why you elected him. You elected him in the first place because you believed in him. And now he is there to do the work for which you elected him. But what I'm him. saying is that then the president has do dibble, the work. dibble dabbled in a couple of things that he has said. You know, let, so. him, let him do the work. Well, you know what, what we seem to see in the country is a, is a segment of the populace that wants to lead the president by the nose. Do this and do it now. Do it and do it my way. No, no. Presidents don't, don't operate like that. On that note, let's take a short break and we'll be right back on the Osasa Show. Some say Africa's golden era is gone. A time when great African kings and queens built their dreams into empires stretching across the continent and beyond. But we say a new era is upon us. A new set of African kings and queens are on the rise. Driven by the same wealth of character as the kings and queens before them. Building new empires of enterprise with the right partnership so rise up wherever you are, new kings and queens of Africa. Embrace your full potential and be proud of your heritage. Heritage Bank, your timeless wealth partner. Welcome back to the Osasu Show. Still with me is Mr. Femi Adeshina, Special Advisor to the President on Media and Publicity. Thank you so much for sitting tight with us, sir. Thank you. We've been discussing various trending issues in uh, Nigeria so far. Mm -hmm. I've fielded my questions to Mr. Femi Adeshino, and he has answered to the best of his ability. <laughs> <laughs> so right now we'll be taking your questions from social media um, directly, your questions as it is, and we'll be fielding that to Mr. Femi Adeshino as well. We're discussing again trending issues, everything that you want to ask the government, you want to hear the government's stance on. He would uh, answer also to the best of his, his ability. So so keep it short so we can get through most of these questions um, in time. Use the hashtag Ask Femi Adeshino and The Osasu Show on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. So sir, we have a question from Jude Jaga on Twitter. He says, what are your thoughts on the DSS, DSS crackdown on the judiciary? Don't you, believe, don't you agree this is tyranny? It's not been tyranny, it's about changing the way we do things, changing the way we think, and changing we are, the way we are as Nigerians. Now specifically to the judges and justices, would you rather have corruption let loose in the country? One retired justice of the Supreme Court says a corrupt judge is worse than a man an armed man with a dagger and a crowd stabbing people all over the place. Mm. So would you rather let corruption ro ro have a field day? No, no. That, 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 that would be terrible for any country. But do you foresee any challenges with the executive arm of government getting involved in the business of the judiciary? Has the executive arm got involved? The I'm DSS is under the executive arm of government, isn't well, it? Well, the, 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 all the same, the DSS is still an independent arm of our security agencies. Mm. They, they saw what was needful. The DSS, among others, is to act against anything that can threaten the state. And of course, you know, corruption in the judiciary is, holds a lot of threat, big threat to the state. And so, the DSS moved against it. Some have alleged that the executive and the government is just using the DSS to do its dirty bids to crack down on judges who mm. granted uh, 
uh, a victory to the PDP, to the opposition party? There will always be allegations. In this country, there will always be allegations. And it is those who ate sour grapes and who still are set on edge that will always come with those allegations. So after wedding whalers, you're not coming. <laughs> You're not calling people <laughs> eaters of sour grapes. If you eat sour grapes, your teeth will be set on edge. You mentioned PDP. Mm -hmm. For 16 years, they were in power. They had unfettered access to the treasury. They plundered that treasury. Now, a Daniel has come to judgment. He's asking them to account for what they did. Naturally, they will not be happy. But the fact that they ate sour grapes means their teeth must be set on edge. But the people in APC are people who, were, who used to be in PDP over that 16 years. Yeah. Why are, have we not seen a list of uh, uh, people, an equal amount of people in the APC being probed? Oh, that, that also shows you that uh, it is not as if uh, the president just grabs anybody. There has to be a prima facie case established against that person. Let that case be established against anybody in APC and you know the president will have, he, he, that, that person will answer, no matter who he is and uh, whatever office he holds under the APC government. Next question, Louis Nefik from Facebook. Mr. Femi Adesh, our Nigerians are not happy with the government. This is not the change they voted for. Nigerians are suffering, children are dying of malnutrition, and the government is turning a blind eye. Well, I'll just say that person is guilty of overgeneralization. When he says Nigerians, what, where is uh, facts? It's not empirical. What research has he conducted? How many Nigerians did he talk to? How many responded this way? How many responded that way? It is not scientific. It is not empirical. He can't sit down and because two or three other people are of the same opinion with him, he now says Nigerians. It's not true. I tell you, millions upon millions upon millions of Nigerians are with this administration. They are with this president. They believe in him. They believe he will bring change to the country and they are willing to wait till that change touches different aspects of our lives. It's not as if the change is not seen. Go and ask the people who live in the Northeast. They will tell you they can go to their farms, they can go to mosques, they can go to churches, they can go to schools, they can travel on roads that have been closed for the past four years. MS are back in their palaces they had fled from in the past three years. NYSC orientation is holding for the first time in two or three years in certain parts of the North. Mm -hmm. So ask those people, when was the last salah in the past four or five years that you didn't have bombs all over the place? The last two salahs, not even a firecracker was had anywhere in that region. Ask those people. They will tell you that change is real and change has, change has come upon them. Mm -hmm. Of course, in different other areas of our national lives, we have seen the change. For instance, uh, don't you trust your government now? particularly the government at the center, you trust the government. No. That, that, wait, let me anchor my thoughts. That was why fuel prices changed, went as high as 145 naira per liter, and all hell didn't break loose because people trusted the leadership. They believed that if this is being done by Muhammad Buhari, our treasury is safe with him. He is doing it for our own good and in our interest. So the fact that the populace believes more in the leadership is evidence of change. There are so many other evidences of change. A, a number of people think change is when the Naira exchanges for uh, one to one to the dollar. That would be uh, a good change. It would be a good change. <laughs> we will get there. That can never happen by a sudden flight. Mm -hmm. That can never happen by just a waving of a magic wand. We'll get there. The economy will pick up. We're in recession now. We'll exit it. And things will get a lot better. But it, 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 it needs patience. It needs patience. Promises have been made. And the good book itself says, <laughs> when you have done the will of God, you still need patience to inherit the promises. So the promises that have been made to Nigerians, we will need patience before we can inherit those promises. And I tell you, as day follows the night, those, those, those promises will be kept.
Mr. Femi Adeshina, thank you again for joining us on today's program. It's thank always you. a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. That's it for today's episode of The Osasu Show. To watch extended clips from this interview, you can visit our website, www.theosasushow.com. You can also visit my personal website to read my articles at osasuigbenadion.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media at osasuigbenadion and at The Osasu Show on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. I'll see you same time, same place next week. And until then, take very good care of yourself. God bless you.